If you can find those places and find those markets that are emerging and be ahead of that and, and use this model, you can do very well financially. It's, it's a little different than the long-term 12 month, let's say lease, but uh, th- there's a whole market coming, I believe, uh, on, especially on the single family side. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? It's Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co-host, Mr. David Green. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm doing great. California is beautiful right now. The the housing market has been so ridiculously hot. It's been very it challenging been crazy. to help put buyers in contract, which it always stings because you know every time somebody buys a house that if they hold it long enough, especially in a market like this, it's not mm. ridiculous to say that house will make them a millionaire at some point. <laughs> and so yeah. when when you can't help people get that goal, it bugs me. But it's cooled off a little bit. So we we had a really good week. We put like 10 people in contract last wow. week. So now I'm like like a flower that just got water again. I'm all excited. There you go. That's cool, man. Well, uh, I do have a question for you. It's actually a pretty serious question. How do you feel about golf? (laughs) Yeah, this is funny. Okay, so Brandon and I had a conversation after this podcast. I just want to bring this up and see if anybody else is on the same page as me. The concept of golf, what you are trying to accomplish is insane. You're talking about taking a ball that's this big, like a couple, like an inch or something in diameter. Like the size of a golf ball. Yeah, the size of a golf ball. That's great. (laughs) And putting it into a hole that is like half the size of a shoe or less than that. It's 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 at over 400 yards of space. Like just if someone said, hey, this is what we're going to do. And you didn't know anything about golf. You'd say that's impossible. That can't (laughs) happen. And yet there's people out there doing 18 holes of this ridiculously impossible task over and over and over. That's yeah. But let me let me give you an analogy here because I know you're not a big analogy, guys. Let me give you one. I'm a brand new investor. I got no money. I don't know what I'm doing. I just heard that real estate's a good idea. And 15 years later, I just crossed $100 million in real estate owned. How's that happen? That's an impossible feat. But you know what's not impossible? It's hitting the ball a little bit. And the first swing, the thing falls off the tee and moves like, you know, six inches. And you feel like an idiot and you put it back on there again. Then you hit it a little further. Then you get it 10 feet. Then you get 10 feet further. And then 50 feet or yards, whatever. I don't know. I don't do yards. And then eventually, if you just keep hitting it toward that hole and you just keep going, eventually it falls in the cup. And that, my friend, is the secret to any success. Thank you. That was good, right? Come on. Great. That was a good analogy, right? So if someone's Mm. having a hard time with real estate investing, go play golf. It will seem very easy after that. (laughs) Or you'll never do anything else your entire life. Well, that's what we were saying. In order to get good at golf, because it's so ridiculously hard, (laughs) the amount of effort people have to put in that, we would have probably cured cancer seven times over if there was just no sport of golf. This might be true. All right. So with that said, let's get to today's quick Quick tip. tip. All right. Today's quick tip is, you know, before I get to the quick tip, let me say this. Today, we're interviewing a genius of a man. His name is Kenny McElroy or Ken McElroy. You've probably heard of him before because he's been on our show before back on episode number. Ken McElroy is also one of the advisors and partners with Robert Kiyosaki in the Rich Dad Company. So he really specializes, my understanding is a lot of Robert's real estate investments. Ken is the person who's actually making the decision, analyzing the properties and directing the, the resources. So he has a ton of experience. Experience buying a lot of property. All right. He was on episode number 52 of the Bigger Pockets podcast wow. a long, long, long time ago. OG, right? Uh, there. Yeah. And Ken is one of the smartest people ever. And so today we talk about a lot of stuff, including uh, whether or not you should go into debt and the, uh, good debt, bad debt, that kind of conversation, whether you're new or you're experienced. We talk about a, a lot about the economy, like what what's happened? What's inflation doing? Does Ken think the real estate market's going to crash soon or do we have some hope? Uh, and what's the data that helps support that? It's a really fun conversation. Now, the reason this is tied into the quick tip today is because we talk a lot about debt and about some of the ways that you can use debt to get wealthy. And so here's my tip for you. Buy a property for your kid. If you have a kid under five years old, buy a property, put it on a 15-year mortgage. It doesn't even have to make money. It could literally break even every month. Buy it, put it on a 15-year mortgage. In 15 years, it's paid off to nothing. You now have a property worth probably a quarter million dollars that you owe nothing on it. Your tenants paid it off. So that's what I've done with my kids. I bought my first one for Rosie like four or five years ago. And Wilder's getting one right now. We're in process of closing on it. In fact, by the time this interview airs, we should have closed on it. And so this 
this basically works because you're using debt to your advantage. You're not paying the mortgage. Your tenants are paying the mortgage, right? It comes out of the cash flow. Uh, and so like you're not doing anything and your property just gets paid off and plus it's going up in value. So that's a quick tip today is if you've got young kids, buy a property for them, put it on a 15 year mortgage, pay it off and their college education is completely paid for. There you go. No, You're no exaggeration. This is like the financial success starter pack for That's your it. kids, your starter kid. Yeah. They're yeah. going to, the, the should pay for their college, pay for their first car and pay for the down payment of their own first home so that they can yeah. go repeat the cycle and, and, and have some left over. And more importantly is it shows a real world pick, a real world picture of the power of assets and versus liabilities and the power of pa- passive income, the power of wealth, the power of real estate in a way that you could never just tell them or make them read a book. You're showing them over the course of 15 years what it can do. So there's your quick tip for today. And now we got to get into today's interview. But before we do, let's hear from today's show sponsors. All right. And I think that's about it. Again, today's show is phenomenal with Ken McElroy. I love this guy. He is amazing and you're going to love him as well. So stay tuned for the whole interview with him. And uh, if you are have not yet left a rating or review for the show on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play, wherever you're listening to this, Spotify, please do so. Uh, let the world know that you like the show. And if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to click that little thumbs up button below the video and uh, you know subscribe to our channel for more content like this. All right, without further ado, I think it's time to get into a very awesome, fun, and deep conversation with the Ken McElroy. All right, Ken, welcome back to the Bigger Pockets podcast, man. Always an honor. Great to have you here. Great. Thanks, guys. As always, I love your show and can't wait to chat about what's, what's happening. Well, thanks, man. Well, for those who maybe didn't listen to your last episode, don't know much about your story, uh, and I, you know, I talked a little bit about you in the introduction, but why don't you give a quick, you know, who are you and how'd you get into real estate? Sure. Yeah. So uh, haphazardly, really, I, I was managing a property uh, uh, out of university and and trying to you know pay rent and and uh, I was making a little bit of money, but I, I immersed myself in property management as I was trying to finish up school, and that really gave me kind of the platform for understanding the you know how how deals work because in property management you know, your entire job is to obviously manage the property well and produce cash flow and, and send the owners checks. And if you don't, you get fired. So, you know, and so that was how I started. And then uh, really, I, I one day, Brent, I was like, you know, I'm on the wrong side of the desk here. I, you know, yeah. whether the owner was coming in and, and I was like, man, how do I own these things? And, and that kind of started my journey. I got my real estate license, started getting educated. And, and I started buying small deals and, and just like everybody, I didn't know how I didn't have any money. My parents certainly didn't have any money. And, and, uh, luckily I was on a wrestling scholarship in college and that's how I got there. But other than that, I probably wouldn't have gone. And, and I, I just started realizing the power of cash flow. I started buying small deals and, and then, um, I started buying bigger deals. We started buying 100, 200 unit deals you know, 20 years ago. And obviously syndicating because you run out of money. And, and then I ran into Kiyosaki. You know, he was uh, honestly, he was just a, somebody I was raising capital on. And, and uh, he had just launched Rich Dad Poor Dad. So this is a while back. And we became friends. And then he's like, you got to teach what you're doing. And uh, so I started doing that. I started writing the books. And, but uh, I've been a hardcore real estate investor and manager. Uh, you know, we have a 250 people uh, working for us. All we do full time is apartments. Uh, we have self storage office and, and that. And and you know, I just love this business. It's just provided the greatest amount of freedom that I can ever imagine. Yeah, yeah, I love it, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It's like you know, the ABCs of real estate investing and the advanced guide. Like those changed my life. I read those books. I was like, I'm going to buy multifamily. And then I started buying multifamily. And now, you know, I don't know, 2000 units, something like that right now. It's just, and it all started with reading that, uh, reading your books. So yeah, you're inspiring a lot of people about like multifamily can get you out of a job and get you out of a, like that life that you, that's like prescribed for us, right? Like work till yeah. you're 70 and then, you know, maybe then you can retire the richest guy in the graveyard. It's like, I don't, I want to do more than that. Right. And that's what your book really taught me. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, you know, I, I, I didn't know how to write a book. I, I, Robert's like, you just need to do it. <laughs> so I did. And, <laughs> and um, you, you know, and then what, what became my why really is I, I started doing, I, I still do. I donated all that's my uh, proceeds for my books and all that stuff to uh, charity. Oh, we have, cool. we, we have a full-time director of philanthropy now at our company and wow. all she, all she does is give away money. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, so that's been great. So it's been a great venue for me to be able to educate 
and and uh, talk about war stories and the stuff that you know I've been through in the last 25 years. You know, buying and and selling apartments and and commercial, and uh, it's it's actually been a blessing. The whole thing. That's cool, man. Well, why don't we, why don't, there's a few things I want to cover today, uh, specifically some of the, like the fundamental rules that have guided your career. Like the thing, I mean, like you're not the guy that came in, like even like David and I, like we kind of got in heavy at the last cycle and we've only really been through, you know, a cycle or now a cycle and a half, but like you've been around for, for long enough to see things come and go. And so you see a big picture. So I want to cover two things today specifically. One, I want to know your thoughts on where we're at in the market. Uh, what's the world doing? The eviction moratorium, what COVID did, where the economy's headed. I want to get you your thoughts on that. And then I want to go into some of the rules, like those, yeah, the fundamental rules or the fundamental truths that you believe in when it comes to like multifamily specifically. Uh, so maybe we can start with uh, the, the first piece there. Sure. It's like, where, where the hell are we going? <laughs> <laughs> like, I know. This is crazy. I know. It's, well, it's interesting to me. I, I, I really, really believe that we're heading into a pretty heavy uh, problem around affordability. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, not not just from the inflation that we're seeing, you know, that's kind of kind of recent. But but um, you, you know, we we always were under delivering new construction and supply for for years. And and you know, if you go back to the National Multi Housing Council, which I'm a member of, or the National Apartment Association, uh, which I'm also a member of, you, you know, they projected that we were thousands and thousands of units uh, off of what we needed to deliver. And, and so what's happened is we're, we have three projects under construction right now. You know, we're getting hammered on construction costs. Yeah. And, and so, you know, and so are the single family guys. So, you know, a, 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 you know, lumber is lumber, right? So it doesn't really matter where it goes. And so I, I think, um, so I really believe, you know, if people, if we're going to continue to build what well, one, we're undersupplied, but two, uh, the, the cost of construction has to has to um, move into a higher mortgage payment, a higher rent payment, and all those kinds of things for t- to to make to make sense. So so I think we're gonna we're we're heading into some serious affordability issues, you know. And and then now you're layering on the inflation piece, and so I think we're gonna see, um, you know, we're gonna have some disruption certainly with the forbearance and and the eviction moratorium and all that. Of course, but but um, on the on the rent side and the eviction side, I I really don't see much disruption from a landlord standpoint, uh, and, and I think we're going to start to see some real squeezes on the single family side more than more than anything. So what would it be? What like would it be? I guess would it be right in saying you don't predict or do you? Uh, or I don't know, predict the wrong word, but you anticipate any kind of decline in prices. Uh, for real estate investors, like, are we worried about another 2008 uh, happening? No, no, I, I don't. I think 2008 was very different. I went through that. Uh, you, you know, there were a bunch of things happening at that time. So everybody wants to compare it. And I, I get that because that's kind of the last, you know, the last thing that happened. Yeah. But, but I think this is more like what what went on in the 70s when we started to see, you know, higher interest rates and, and potentially higher, well, higher inflation and, and, and those kinds of things. And, and certainly, you know, I don't know, you probably don't remember, but I was a kid and people were lining up for gas shortages and all those kinds of things. So I think it's caught probably a little bit more like that. And, um, you know, in, in 08, as you know, what happened was the, um, the market popped and then people owed a lot le- uh, more on their mortgages and their homes. And certainly we're not going to see that because we just saw this big run in pricing. And so even if people are really behind and they're, they can't pay their mortgages or whatever, my, I believe that a lot of them are going to have uh, enough equity in there to cover. I do think we're going to see a lot of listings hit the market. Yeah. And, and I was actually looking at the sporting that there's, there's a bunch of markets that are in trouble. You know, there's Atlanta, it's areas of Atlanta, San Antonio, um, you know, some areas of Dallas, uh, as an example, that that are that are seriously delinquent that, you know, so you're going to have some markets that are going to have a lot of uh, forbearance is going to end and, and you're going to see this kind of uh, onslaught of supply. What will be interesting is to see whether or not it gets covered quickly by the demand, yeah. you know, so it's hard to know. 
Yeah, I, I feel like, and David, I want to add, throw this at you too as being a pretty heavy agent in an expensive market. But yeah, I just feel like there's so much demand right now when you're still getting 30 offers on every house that's out there and 40 tenants applying to rent any of my properties. Like, I still feel like they'll be able to absorb that when it does hit. But I don't know. David, what do you think? I really like that we're bringing this up. Brandon and I, we feel a lot of pressure because people look up to us with, what do I do? What, <laughs> what should I expect? I think, Ken, I, I see a lot of the videos you put out you clearly are in the same yeah. boat because the videos that you put out are, are an indication of the questions you're being asked. And so as people are listening, that's what they're asking is what's going to happen. And I noticed one of the things that comes up a lot is this idea of like, can you just mention the foreclosure moratorium ending and there should be a wave of people that fell behind in their properties. And that immediately makes us think of 2010 when we had the same problem. And we had too much supply and not enough demand at the time. People had lost their jobs, so no one was really looking to buy a house. We still had sort of enough supply for the people there was. So throwing all these foreclosures in the market immediately created oversupply. Prices dropped. Investors, if we were bold, cleaned up at that time. But we're now we haven't really built many houses since then. First off, that's the thing a lot of people don't realize if we're talking about single family homes. I think at least what I've noticed is the multifamily space has really done a better job of keeping up with demand. If you lived in Austin, Seattle, San Francisco, you saw condo high rises going up everywhere, but single family homes have it. So the population grew, the supply of real estate did not. That happened for a long time and we didn't really think about it until all of a sudden, why is this rent so expensive? Why is it so hard to get a property? <laughs> and one thing to consider is as these uh, people that are behind on their mortgages, when the when it comes due, they probably have a lot of equity and could just sell it. That's the first thing. It doesn't automatically mean it's going into foreclosure. And like Brandon yeah. mentioned, there's such a shortage of supply. And that and this is also market specific. It's not everywhere. But I think in most big cities in the country, if we had an onslaught of listings that hit the market, it would sort of be like your bucket's overflowing with water and it's spilling into the sand. It would just get sucked up right away because there's, there's 10, 12 offers on every halfway decent house. So if... We, if we doubled our inventory, you just have five to six offers on every house. There's still <laughs> so much demand. And my fear when people hear this is they say, I'm going to wait to buy. They could buy right now. They're in a position where it makes sense for them to do it. And they hear that and they get a little bit greedy and they think, okay, I'm just going to wait for that to happen. And then they like it's a flash in the pan. It's gone. It never happens. And then they missed out. I'm curious, Ken, what from your angle, what your perspective is on that? Well, so uh, it's a great question, David. Uh, so... I think a lot of t I think a mistake a lot of people make is that they they broad brush real estate as if the whole market the whole U.S. Yep. is kind of the same market. So I'm actually closing on a single family home in Scottsdale tomorrow. Nice uh, and 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 Scottsdale is arguably on fire. And, and I had to you know, I offered over list and and um, you know I'm I'm uh, I actually it's a long story as to why I'm doing that, but but I ended up it's going to be a rental. And it's it's going to be a cash flowing rental, and, and so I personally still think there's a lot of markets that have a lot of run rate, and and um, you, you know like like Phoenix, like Scottsdale is very affordable still as compared mm -hmm. to uh, some of the other markets. So like like you think about this, uh, I'm paying 500 grand for for a home in Scottsdale, which is cheap in my opinion, and and. Um, it, you know, based on what the rents uh, and so it it all boils down to math. And I think that there are there are areas that are 600, 700, 800 with the same rent. Mm -hmm. And there are areas that are 300, 400, let's say, you know, with less rent. So but it just has to do with the math around the cash flow. And as you guys know, because you guys are cash flow guys, I always solve to the cash flow. And and so if I don't ever want to be in a situation where I'm feeding something, you know, and trying mm -hmm. to trying to time the market. So if, for me, if it cash flows, then I, we always are considering it. I think a further complication in understanding, because your point really, I should say first is, is exactly right. It's what it's worth to you. How does the math work out to you is a much smarter way to look at it than, well, what does it compare to everything else, which is what people get stuck into. What I've noticed is, and Scottsdale's a perfect microcosm of this example, is short-term rentals have introduced a completely different system of generating cash flow. They are less passive. They're not passive investing when you do that, but they are going to be more profitable in most cases if they're run well. 
And now if you can buy a property in an area like Scottsdale that will cash flow more as a short term rental than it would as a traditional rental, someone can pay more for that same property and still make more money. They can pay $100,000 more than what it's worth, the ARV, compared to comparables, and it's still an amazing buy for them. So what happens is that pushes up the ARV of all the other property in Scottsdale. Before we had the short-term rental sort of information put into the algorithm, you bought a house because you wanted to live in it, so you just looked at the comparables, or you bought it because it was going to cash flow, which meant you were probably somewhere around the 1% rule and you're in very specific markets, and the rent that it could generate determined its worth, but it was one or the other. The short-term rental thing just kind of screwed everything up as far as the way that we look at it. it what Brandon and I say is... So this is like governments are stepping in right now that have shut down those things. Like Atlanta, I know, is, is having a big push against Airbnb right now, and Hawaii shut it down almost mm-hmm. entirely, uh, and a lot of other cities are doing that. Because, yeah, they see the same thing as you... It, it changed the game in a, in a in a weird way that made it unaffordable for most people who just work a normal job. That's the concern is if houses. you're a regular person who just wants to live in a house and you're competing with someone that can generate $10,000 in gross income yeah. on this property, you can't pay as much as what they can pay. The rules change for how we evaluate real estate. And I think to a larger degree, with the amount of stimulus that the government has created, the rules have changed as far as what is a dollar worth? How, what am I doing with my money? And this is just, it's on my mind all the time is if I'm, if I'm stuck playing football, the way that the rules were set up 10 years ago, and I'm trying to draft a really good running back and really good blockers for that running back, I'm going to lose to the team that has adjusted and they're drafting a really good quarterback and a line to get him time and wide receivers to throw the ball to. And can you watch sort of rules change over the years? And so I just wanted to get your take on, cause you're, cause I love the points you're making. Are, are we on the right path with the way that we're perceiving this? I, I believe you are. I, I, I listen, as you guys know, I'm still buying. You guys are still buying. We're mm-hmm. all buying. And, yeah. and now there are definitely markets that, uh, you don't want to buy in. And, and, um, there are markets that you do want to buy in. And, 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 you know, so when I look at, uh, just going back to the Scottsdale example, you, you know, if you take that same place and drop it in Seattle or you drop it in LA or you drop it in Chicago or you drop it, you know, and, and in some of the other markets, that is very, very cheap. And, and so, so you know, when I look at where people are going, and and certainly Arizona is one of those places. Uh, and, and to your point, Brandon, we got all kinds of people moving there. We got all kinds of demand on both the buying side and the rental side. So, so for me, it all makes sense. And to your point, David, you know, I think. You know, there's there's three factors going on there. If you're a homeowner and you're trying to buy a home, you know, you are you're not in this in the same you're not dealing with the same set of circumstances as somebody like me who's going to rent it uh, and yeah. and or someone like that is going to put a uh, an Airbnb or a short term program around it. And and I've been doing short term for years, bef- way before Airbnb, I had almost 200 of them in Scottsdale. And we were renting to the San Francisco Giants and the Cleveland Indians for spring training and all those kinds of things. And so we've always been doing that. And, um, um, you, you know, now, of course, it's all, uh, you know, uh, all, you know, through Airbnb and, and, and through some of the other services, it's, it's gotten way more professional and, and much, much better. But I, I listened to the CEO of Airbnb the other day, and he said that, Airbnb is no longer just a short term thing. And what he was saying was, and I think this is true. I think what's going to happen for a lot of people is they're exiting and they're selling, but now they're actually using Airbnb as more of a lifestyle. Yeah. And they're actually, they're actually going places and not actually owning them. So they're, you know, they'll stay three months, four months somewhere and, and, and just do that. And, and I, I think that this, is here to stay. I think that behavior is here to stay, especially with this work from home model. You know, that reminds me, uh, I'm doing a, I'm launching this kind of side business, going to test it out, but for the exact same reasons you're just saying there's, there's like a shift in the culture of people right now. And so I launched, well, it's not a, well, it's kind of officially launched, but uh, it's going to be called month in Maui. It started with month in Maui and we're going to buy a bunch of vacation rentals here, but the idea is different than Airbnb in that I'm like, people don't want to just come for a week. I mean, people are still coming for a week, but there's a certain type of traveler now that can come for an extended period of time. So we're like, and, and car rentals are hard and all those things. So we're like, we we're literally like you get the 
You get the condo or the house, you get a car rental, you get a bunch of activities, you get kind of white glove service for that type of traveler who's thinking differently. And like, I want to expand that thing to like cities all across the world. Or there's month in Maui, month in London, month in, you know, Cabo, whatever. So, cause it's just a different type of traveler. And then if I can do that, I can get outside the Airbnb, you know, like thing. I can build my own brand around it. So that's, that's one side thing I'm doing right now, just because I see that shift in the way that people are traveling, the way, the way that people can work anywhere now. Uh, a lot of people can work you know, from a distance. So why live in Ohio for the winter when you could go live in Maui for the winter and work on your yeah. tech job there? I think that's a, that's something here to stay. So as I, I'm, I was originally going to probably buy something on the beach in like Newport or Manhattan or whatever. And I, what I ended up doing is I'm, I'm renting something there in August and September and yep. it's expensive. Uh, I'm not going to lie on a daily rate, but when I'm done, it's done. And I'm, you know, mm-hmm. and I don't own it. I don't have the property tax issues. I don't have all the stuff that's going on on the home ownership side. So it, you know, there's a lot of guys like us that are, you know what, I'm just going to go take down something really nice and, and I'm going to stay there and, and, you know, call it a day. And, and I, I, I do yeah. believe that's here to stay. Yeah. If you look at the way people rent cars, less people are going to car rental places. More people are using Turo. Like Turo. Uber yeah. took a lot of people who used to want to own a car and now they don't have to, especially if you live in a dense population. It's That's what I mean by the rules of the game change. Yeah. People don't want to go through the hassle of having to own a car and take care of the maintenance and pay the insurance and then not use it when they travel. I think COVID really jump-started this movement. And if you think about Airbnb, it's sort of combining Turo with Uber with Yelp. I can look and I can see what am yeah. I getting when I go to this place and I and I can see the reviews of what's there. And so what I, I think you, you're right, Ken, that it's here to stay. And one thing that I think about is more and more properties, because we're probably not going to be able to keep up with the demand for supply. We're just it's they're going to stay scarce for a, a while now. Will be used in this way. The highest and best use of that property is this Airbnb model. So for investors, that means Passive investing will get harder and harder. You're going to have to manage the property in this way. And for renters, it's going to get harder and harder to find properties that you can just rent paying by the month and staying in for a long time like people have gotten away with because more and more properties are going to go towards this short-term rental purpose. So I'm encouraging people. That's one more reason you want to buy a house. You don't want to leave your destiny in the hands of the market as it's changing. Yeah, I I agree. You know... I, I, I for years had second and third homes, guys. And, and you know, and air, when you really start to take a look at the, the burn rate, mm. you know, and, and, and all of that, and I was staying Emma for two, three months at a time, kind of met and bouncing around. And I've changed my whole model to just my big primary home that I have. I'm actually building one. And, and, um, and, and now we're just going to just move around and kind of go where we want to go and, and don't kind of have that commitment and see if we like the area. And, and I have a number of friends doing the exact same thing yeah. all over the country to your point, Brandon, I think, I think this is a new market. It's, uh, and you, you know, you start kind of started with that inspirato model, which, you know, I'm a member of. And, and, you know, take, we would take down these big houses and, and, you know, bring a bunch of friends and have a great time and, and yep. then lock and leave and go home and, you, you know, that's it. Right. And, and somebody else. And so, so to your point, if, if you can find those places and find those markets that are emerging and be ahead of that and, and use this model, you can do very well financially. It's, it's a little different than the long term 12 month, let's say lease, but, uh, there's a whole market coming, I believe, uh, on uh, especially on the single family side. Yeah. Well, two more two more things that we've seen affecting like d- rules that have changed a little bit. The game is the the cost of you know we mentioned it earlier lumber is going through going crazy and it's come down a little bit, but it's going crazy. And then the cost of labor is going up. It's harder to find people that want to work anymore for eight nine dollars an hour, and and those things are obviously going to affect home prices as well. I'm wondering what do you see with that? Is this a temporary blip we're seeing? Is is it supply and demand? Is this inflation hitting us? Is this hyperinflation? How do you yeah. view these rising costs? So it's a good question. So we have a property under construction right now, 330 units, and our lumber package was one million higher than our budget. Ooh, ooh. Lum- that's lumber only. Lumber. And yeah. and now that was two months ago. It's since come down. Uh, 
And, and so I think some of them are supply chain issues, uh, appliances, you know, concrete, OSB, uh, lumber, those kinds of things. And we're starting to see some, uh, you know, you know, those kind of moderate a little bit, but they're certainly higher to your point. And there's a lot of reasons for that, Brandon. Um, some of it had to do with some of the trade issues, like between Canada and the U.S. and Mexico or, you know, and obviously COVID and the pandemic and all those kinds of things. And so uh, but then the other piece was during the pandemic, everybody started doing rem- remodels. And so if, if you owned uh, hardware stores or anything like that, you killed it. And, and, you know, everybody was adding on to their homes and putting decks in and all those kinds of things. So you kind of had this run mm-hmm. uh, in addition to that kind of a supply issue. So I think that that is going to iron itself out. But I do think we're going to have some permanent uh, inflation on a number of those items. But I don't think it's going to be quite what you, you know, what the what you see in the, in, in the media. Mm. And and um, but at the end of the day, as you guys know, but if if you know if you're trying to buy a home and i have a bunch of friends that are doing home building and and the homes are 30 40 50,000 more and so they're not even giving people prices and and i think yeah. what i think the issue they're going to have is at some point they're going to they're going to be priced out affordably cuz i as you guys know we can't really lower rates much more than than they are Yep. And especially they, they use inflation or they use uh, interest rates to tamper mm-hmm. inflation. So it's it, that could be the that could be the tipping point potentially. With lumber this expensive, yeah. it really makes you wonder how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so the, the, we're talking about some of the rules that have changed. Things like Airbnb, the, the labor and lumber shortages and increase in those prices. Those are rules that have really changed the game over the last few years. I want to shift now and talk about some of the rules that don't change. Some of the things that, that work in that, at least in your opinion, can have worked in any market regardless as you've built up this massive multifamily business. What have you seen that just this just works? Well, I, I, I as you guys are, as same with me, I, there's, there will always be, if you pay attention to the home ownership versus the rental piece, you know, if you go anywhere abroad, like, you know, let's call Europe, let's say, or Asia, there's a very, very, very high percentage of the population that is always rented. In the US, yeah. we've always pushed home ownership. Nothing wrong with that, but that's been what we've done. And so, um, I think that we're heading into a more of a renter nation. And I think this could be a 10 to 15 year run that, that we're going to see, you know, because of affordability. And so to your point, the one thing that, that I think if, if you're going to get into this business, I think there's going to be an ample supply of renters, just like there is all around the world. Yeah. And, and I think that, um, if you're, if you're a good landlord and, 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 you know, and, and, and you understand how, how that whole, whole thing works. This could be a very, very, very good run. And then take advantage of this inflation by hedging the, you know, you, with uh, these fixed rate interest rates if you can. So, you know, we just, we just closed on a deal uh, in Houston uh, uh, two weeks ago and, you know, we're at 3%. And, and, uh, yeah. and, and so when inflation comes out around four, I'm like, man, this is great. You know, we're basically borrowing, it's free. And, and, you know, based on inflation. So if you can use other people's mm-hmm. money through through debt or even equity uh, and and kind of hedge inflation, it, it's it's just I, I, I think those are one of the things, Brandon, that you will always see. Now, there's we you know, nobody's really seen inflation uh, this generation, at least. But I've been through it. And and the, the anytime you can get that fixed, that's why I think that you should get into debt right now if it's covered by by uh, cash flow. You know, don't just do it. You know, based on a capital gain strategy because that that could bite you in the butt. But but if you can get debt covered, I think I think in ten years you're going to look back and go, I'm so glad I did that. I'm going to pay back this debt for yeah. you know, with these cheaper dollars and and. 
that has never changed and that won't change. And, and you just got to sit back and kind of watch the policy. It's also one of the hardest good point. components to real estate investing. I was just talking about this to my team yesterday. Even me who believes in real estate, owns real estate, loves real estate, makes my living from real estate. It's always hard to focus on buying the next property when there's all these other stuff going around because it's in year one, it's not a life-changing event. It's 10 years down the road where you're like, oh, I'm so glad I did that. Yeah. And anything in life that you don't see res- a big result for five to 10 years is just harder to do, but it's that much more important. You're, you're so right, Ken. And I'm always reminding myself, if it, 10 years of rent projections, what is this going to look like? Does that get me excited so I can keep my focus on what matters? Yeah. I mean, especially when the renter pays to your yep. mortgage, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> why would you not do that? I, you know, the stuff that we're buying, and I know you guys look at this. So, it, you know, it costs us because we're builders too. It costs us about 200 plus per unit to build something right now on, a, on the apartment yeah. site, roughly. Well, okay. So yesterday I was on an investment committee call. We're, we, we're, we're always going over you know, six to 10 deals a week. And, and, you know, we're looking at stuff that's priced at 140, 150 a door that was built 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And I'm like, buy it, you, you know, cause yeah. we're, you know, we're, we're buying at so much less than you can build it. If you scraped it and had to build it today, it would be significantly more. And, and as long as you're covering it with rent, and you're putting good debt on it and you're not, you know, trying to play the capital gain strategy, then I think there's massive, there's stuff that's so underpriced uh, still today. Yeah. If you look at the cost to replace it, and that's the way I'm looking mm. right now is if we can buy something at, let's say, 60, 70 percent of what it would cost to replace mm-hmm. it. And, you know, after renovation, then then I still think that those are good opportunities. Yeah, we just picked up a uh, a property in Houston. It's a 500 plus unit thing. We we got for 108 uh, a unit and like half of them are more than half are already completely remodeled. And the things like I'm like, you can't build this thing for, for, for that. I mean, they just put 40 million dollars of work into it over the last like half a decade just to get it up to where it's at right now. I'm like. 108, you can't build anywhere close to that right now. So that's what I said, Brad. So I said to the, I said to my acquisition guys, I go, okay, if that building that we're buying is in Phoenix, what would it cost to build? Yeah. And they were like, well, it's you know, it's seventy five thousand more per unit. Well, I'm like, okay, next, you know, like let's go. Yeah. And and yep. and, and and then you take other people's money through debt, yep. match it up, and and yep. and. and you know, the tenants pay off your mortgage. It's, it's the greatest model, What you guys are teaching. And you know, what I've, what I've been trying to teach people, it's the greatest model. You can make your investors a tremendous amount of money. Uh-huh. You can make yourself a tremendous amount of money and it's a win win for everyone. Yeah. I, I, I call it in the, in the multifamily millionaire book, I call it the multifamily millionaire model, but it's basically just the exact what you taught in ABCs of real estate investing. It's this idea of like, you know, when you buy these properties over time, they go up in value. When you force the, you know, you force them up because you improve them, you get higher rents at the same time, the mortgage getting paid off at the same time, your investors are the ones to plan the down payment and, and everything just, and then you get the tax benefits and the write-offs and the cost tags and all that stuff. It just, it's like a win, 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 win across the board for everyone. Uh, which is, you know, it's exciting stuff. Yeah. Uh, I love this stuff. It, it is the greatest. We, we had a, I bought a property in Mesa, Arizona. And at the time, like six years, seven years ago, our acquisition guy it was $34 million. I was like, man, I don't know. You know, this thing's <laughs> tight. Da, 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 da. So my acquisition guy uh, actually left and started working for another group. And um, we're still super close. And so he sent an offer for the same property for uh, 87 million. So, <laughs> so for 53 million more that we paid while he was my acquisition guy. And my yeah. partner and I are like, no, nope, you know, we're, we're going to hold it because it's cash flowing, even though we have all this equity. And the, the point behind that is, you know, we're cash flow guys. You, you know, I, yeah. we could sell it. We'd have all this cash. And then we have the same problem that he yep. has trying to find a home mm-hmm. for it. And, and so if, if you have a strategy of passive income, long-term and tax benefits to your point, Brandon, it is the best because you, you're getting lots of money in ca- in passive income. You're not paying tax legally because of the depreciation that you have. And, and it's a win. It's a win-win. And yeah. all you just use that little refinance 
model, you know, at, 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 so, which is exactly what we're doing after Charlie called. Yep. I said, hey, let's, let's <laughs> see, let's see if we can scoop 10 or 20 million out of this deal tax free because it's a cash yeah. out refi and, yep. and, and just move it to the next deal. Yeah, that's so good. Hey, I want to, you know, we were talking about a lot of, you know, a little bit about higher level conversation today. So I want to take it to more those who are listening to that are brand new, but related to what we're talking about here, when you mentioned debt, kind of that rule about if you can get your mortgage covered and then some, like it just, it just makes sense. Right. But how does that work for the guy who's just getting started? That's nervous about they've, they've heard Dave Ramsey. They've heard all the, you know, Susie Orman, don't go into debt, get out of debt, get out of debt. Is it, is it, like, what do you say to those people who are saying, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I should use debt. Debt sounds dangerous. Debt sounds risky to buy their first or second, third property. Yeah. I, so I, 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 I actually do agree with some of Dave Ramsey for the right person. And so yep. if you're, if, if you're just a hardworking person and you're working for the man and, 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 you know, maybe paying off your home completely and not having that kind of worry and stress, uh, I get that. Um, you know, that's not our audience, in my opinion. You know, if, yep. if, if you're trying to, if you're trying to, uh, make this a business, then, then really mm. debt is your friend. It really is good debt, by the way, as yeah. you know, and as you guys know, the difference between good debt and bad debt. So good debt is covered by cash flow. And, yep. and, and so I'm a massive fan and, and, uh, of, of, of using debt and we've done it for years. Tenants pay it off for you. If you can, yep. if you can fix debt and before, as you guys know, the our, you know, we had inflation around two ish, I guess, uh, over the years. And so we were getting, we were getting debt at four or 5%, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. Now it's closer into the three to four range, let's say in some cases under three, but now that inflation has gone higher than that, then really, if if you're sitting on cash, you're you're in trouble because yeah. your your spending power on the money that you have in savings is actually hurting you because it's going down right now by you know on the average I guess of let's say four plus percent a year. So in ten years, theoretically, uh, you know that same money would buy you forty percent less stock. So, yeah. so that's what I mean about debt. And so I look at, I look at real estate assets. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be multifamily. You know, I, I buy billboards and, and you know, commercial office and self storage and all that kind of stuff, but all using debt. And, and, yeah. uh, and then I'm letting the, the forces of the, you know, the, the policy makers, uh, whatever they do is fine with me because I'm just kind of, I'm just adjusting based on whatever they're doing next. And so when, when this administration is throwing everybody money, it's, yeah. it's actually coming to us. Essentially, it's going to the, the person that's coming to us in rent. Uh, yeah. And then we're using it to pay off the mortgage. And, and so, you, you know, and we're going to start to see more and more and more of that. I really believe that we're going to hit this affordability issue. And, and I think the government's going to step up for the renter and for the landlord. And yeah. there's going to be all kinds of opportunities for us because the one thing people need, and to your point of what hasn't changed, is housing. You, mm, it, yep. It's always going to stay in the private sector. The tax laws are all set up for us, and and they will always be. And we're always going to have these yeah. massive tax benefits. I agree, yeah. And and I think part of that is because, I mean, I think a lot of our, our lawmakers own real estate. But I think the other piece is they just really like, – the, 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 the tax code is not written to – like give some people a discount because we the government likes them, right? It's in, it's designed to incentivize. In fact, I think I even heard this first from Kiyosaki's uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. It's like designed to incentivize behavior, right? Like I think David, you made the point the other day. It's like if you give your kid a dollar if they want make their bed, like they're not cheating you it's by taking that dollar and making their bed. Yeah, yeah it's not a loophole. Yeah, yeah it's it's a <laughs> as much as like it's a it's like. It's carefully designed. And now, obviously, there are, I'm sure, areas of our government where they're like, yeah. you know, helping some guy. But mo like they want us to invest in real estate. They they don't do it because they're nice. They do it because we provide housing for millions and millions of people. And jobs. Right. And jobs. That's right. I, I mean, it, it, it's interesting because, you, you know, Tom Will Wheelwright wrote a great book, Tax-Free Wealth. And yep. he, you know, in, in my conversations with him, he said the, 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 the tax codes every year are literally designed for uh, where the government wants money, period. Yep. 
that could be oil and gas. It could be alternative fuel stuff. It could be whatever it is, affordable housing. It, you know, we just saw that with the opportunity zone stuff. And so, you know, which was a real estate play if, you know, if you chose to do that. And, and so yeah. they will always be those kinds of things. And, and there's no way the government's already shown that they're not very good at buying and managing and building housing. I mean, we saw that for, you know, the, <laughs> uh, you know, over, over the years. And, 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 uh, and so I, I think, um, you know, as long as you pay attention to what the government's basically serving you up, mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah. and you can do very, very, very well with these government programs. You made a really good point earlier. I don't want us to gloss over when you said, I just look at what the government's given me and I go with it. When when I was in uh, Tahoe at a GoBundance event, Robert Kiyosaki came to speak there and he made a point where he said something I thought was very profound. He said, I don't get caught up in trying to force people to see the political uh, landscape the way I do. I don't get mad when liberals say they want to do this thing or conservatives say they want to do this thing. And, and really, that's what most human beings that I come across do is they want to change how someone else thinks to make them think more the way they do. He said, there's heads and there's tails. There's equal sides of a coin. I don't want to pick a side of the coin because then I only see half of it. I want to stand on the edge of that coin where I can look over one side and see what, what the heads is doing. And I can look on the other and see what the tails is doing. And when I understand the landscape, I make the best decision. And that's why I keep using this example of a rule book, because I, I notice a lot of people just have anger when it comes to what the government, I'm angry they're printing all this money, or I'm angry they're not printing enough money. I'm angry interest rates aren't high enough. I'm angry we haven't lowered them more. There's always people that want opposite things. And when you get caught up in the emotion of wanting to change things that you can't control, you don't make good decisions for yourself. It's much better to say, well, they changed the rule book in the NFL again. You can't touch wide receivers for the first five yards. That's going to suck. Well, <laughs> guess we better draft better wide receivers and just accept we're going to maybe we need better yeah. pass rushers instead of better cornerbacks or something. And now you change your strategy to fit the way the rules are written instead of trying to change the rules or the government to go the way you want to. And I, I wanted to highlight that because what you're saying is it's a stress free, non toxic happier, more productive way to to sort of look at these decisions that will have a big impact on the way that real estate investing or other investing works. Yeah. It's a, it's a heck of a point, David. I, I don't care who's in office. I I, I mean, I do, don't get me wrong. I vote and, you know, I have my beliefs and all that stuff, but it is what Mm. it is. And so, you know, as they roll these things out, the PPP or the um, you know, the, the mm-hmm. IDLs mm-hmm. and, and the, the money that they're throwing at, at, at folks, you just have to adjust. You just have yeah. to. But the one thing I can tell you that I believe as a result of all of this, this affordability stuff that, that Brandon was kind of talking about on the labor, you, you know, prices have gone way up and wages have not. And so, you know, we have a real issue, I think. And I, do. I keep talking about this affordability issue. The government is going to step in. They will, just like they did when they introduced Section 8, just like they did when they introduced these these tax credits that they give developers to, you know, as incentives. I had uh, two weeks ago on my podcast, the director of housing for Arizona. Uh, Ironically, I knew him, um, you know, 10 years before that, you know, professionally. And I said, um, I said, Tom, the, 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 the one thing that would really help a developer would be to lower the impact fees and the cost, of, you know, before we actually even break ground, you know, there's massive costs. And I said, if you can reduce the parking requirements, if you could reduce the density issues or increase the density issues and you can reduce the impact fees, then we can start to build more affordably. But by the time we actually are building, you know, there's a number, you know, you buy the land is X, but then the number before you actually start is Y. And that all goes to the city and the county and the state. And so, you know, people don't realize a lot of times that sometimes the the cost of not, not I'm not talking about lumber. I'm talking about the cost, the city costs can be so absorbent that you, you actually can't build and therefore it creates these uh, affordability issues. And I, I think that the, the cities are going to come are going to uh, start to change some of their policies 
around affordability, around credits, and they're gonna they're gonna offer developers. It's gonna piss people off because. But to your point, David, we're undersupplied right now. We have so much demand, and uh, without an equal balance. You're not gonna. You're not gonna have affordability, and, and and so that's the biggest issue. The biggest issue that these cities are facing right now are homelessness, and yeah. and 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 um and the money's going to continue to come. So if you just wrap your head around the fact that they're going to be throwing money at renters, they're going to be throwing money at the unemployed, and they're going to be throwing money at developers, that's actually what's coming for the next ten years. I agree. I think the development thing is is fascinating. And I think because like. I, I, the way I see cycles working a lot, and maybe I, I probably learned this from your book, but like it t- they tend to, there's not enough housing. And so then they start building a whole bunch of housing and then it's really good for a while. But then builders at some point in the cycle, like because it takes so long to build and to get the permits, then they're kind of left holding the bag once it gets overbuilt. And then the market kind of tends to drop. And again, there's a million reasons that markets might drop, but I don't see that drop happening. And so I think developers and I think getting into development is going to be a powerful tool. Yeah. Like you said, for the next decade, I think there's going to be a lot of room to go there. Uh, the thing that can slow that down, of course, is if, if the cost of building just keeps going up. Right. Yep. So how does that, how do those two play in together? If, if, if there's a lot of money being made in development, but prices just are skyrocketing in terms of what it costs to build, I guess, does that just mean rents go up to have to cover that? Like they just inevitably yeah. rents are going to have to go up. Yeah. Yeah. So again, just kind of going back to that basic math. It's a great question. You, you know, you got to kind of project, is the market going to be there from the, you know, from the renter side or from the home buyer side later? Uh, because the truth is guys, as you know, it costs the same. My, my lumber in Texas or in Arizona, it's the same price. Yeah. You, you know, what's different is the land, the rent, and then the fees and all the stuff that, you know, that come with that. And so, so, you know, I, what I'm hopeful is that we'll start to see some governments relax things around zoning as an example. So like something uh, like, you know, like Hawaii right now is they're, you know, they don't, they're anti-growth, anti-development generally. And, And so, but they've always been that way. And that's why they have three generations in, you know, in, yep. in homes. Uh, it might be the only state in the country that's actually seen that. I actually think we might start to see that more where you're going to have to, people are going to start to double up and we're going to start to see some, you know, that's probably the next thing that's going to happen is you might have multiple generations in a home. Yeah. What well, you see a ton of out here in Hawaii, I mean, a ton of it is the houses that have been, I call them in the, in the, the book, the multifamilion are called monster houses, right? Where they just take a house and it's like Frankenstein, they add on a little <laughs> bedroom here and they shove a little thing out in the yard. They turn the garage into a unit. And so I mean, all, I would say 90% of every house I've been to in Maui, is one of those in some way. My own house, like my own downstairs is a separate unit from the upstairs that they took the staircase out at one point. Then I got an Ohana there. It's like an ADU in the back. It's it's everywhere here because it's the only way people can afford to live because it's just not, the, the affordability is just so hard. So yeah, I see that spreading, especially California has introduced a lot of AD, ADUs laws recently for the ability to build those. I think building ADUs, building those extra units on a property is a super interesting niche. Not something I'm going to, I'm going to get into because I'm too busy with other stuff, but I, w- I would love to just build a business that just builds ADUs in people's backyards. Cause I mean, like you can build a house for a hundred grand, a little, you know, two bedroom house and the thing rents for 1500 bucks a month and you don't have to pay for land costs cause they already own it for, you know, like, I think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity there. If the, if the uh, government is you know friendly with that, yep. which I think we're going to see more and more of. That's the zoning part. That's exactly what I'm yep. saying. I, I really, you know, yeah. so you got an acre or two acres somewhere with a home on it. I, yep. you're going to start to see more density and, you know, and, yeah. and they're going to have to, they're going to have to make those kind of concessions. And so to your point, David, those, you know, just look at where things are heading. The city's going to have to step up. If, if they hold the line on things like zoning or parking requirements or impact fees or things like that, then, you know, and, and it doesn't allow you to do exactly what Brandon said, then you, there's no end in sight. There's, you know, you're going to have to, allow to be able to split up a lot, build, build more homes on it, maybe build a duplex and provide more housing. You know, one thing that I speculate on, I don't know, is I, I think what you two said is exactly what we should expect to see. And the reason being, to put it shortly, is it's just too hard and too expensive to build properties fast enough for what we need. What I anticipate and I'm sort of betting on is when this becomes an affordability problem, uh, 
problem. It gets brought up to government. Government will do what they always have been doing in America is they'll say, we need to get involved and fix this. They will increase the Section 8 mm-hmm. housing voucher program to apply to more people. So, you know, I don't don't go build your whole strategy, what I'm about to say, but just to try to offer a little bit of wisdom. I'm expecting that the number of people that apply for Section 8 will grow, that the government at some point will say housing is a right, just like food is a right and medicine is a right. Like if you show up in an emergency room, we don't turn you down. And and we're sort of on a trend of labeling things as rights. And I'm not taking opinion, good or bad on that. I'm just saying that's the way it goes. So I'm expecting housing will become a right. And if you own the real estate, you will have the government paying your rent for you instead of the tenants in a lot of cases. And if you're if you're making decisions just on the way the game is played right now, you're probably not thinking that way. You're going to say no to a lot of deals. If you're thinking the way that I am and I'm looking at 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, what is the rule book going to look like? You'll make different decisions. And that's why I love having these conversations because it's hard for me to see it becoming incredibly difficult to live somewhere and the government not intervening to try to make it better. They have to. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. they really truly have to. And one of the things that we were studying uh, years ago as we were figuring out where to buy and what to do was the what we call the response times and uh you know to certain city cores so like uh we were looking at san francisco and the response time for a paramedic fireman police person let's say well you know they have to live 15 20 minutes outside the city because of affordability so these are Mm. not these are not new issues you know, if you're a, if you're a a teacher or you know or you're just a service worker and you can't live somewhere, it becomes a problem. So this is this is not new, and, and I I think that you're going to start to see more and more and more of those kinds of things come out. I think you're going to start to see, um, you know, money thrown at developers. You're going to see some easing of the zoning, and potentially, hopefully. Um, you know, we'll start to see some some easing of the on the development cycle because the the private sector has to help solve this, and the government is definitely going to throw money at the renter because they don't want homelessness. Yeah, man, so good. Well, Cam, before we get you out of here, any other final like rules or or fundamental truths that have applied in your in your business? I don't want to leave anything on the t- uh, you know off the table here. Anything else you can throw in there? Yeah, the the only thing is I would be um, very careful of being kind of a pioneer. So, you know, I've tried it before. Yeah. It doesn't work. So, you know, <laughs> like uh, it, it's funny, you, you know, whenever whenever I see somebody, you know, trying something new or going out into a market yep. and and uh, just be very, very careful of that. What you, what you want is you, you want to stay in tune with it, but, but uh, not be the pioneer. Let somebody else be the pioneer and then kind of come in behind there. And also... The number one thing that I get, and I'm sure you guys get, is everybody says, I, I, I don't have any money. I don't know how to start. I know for a fact, all three of us here started with no money. And, yep. and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's what you see, not what you have. It, it really, truly yeah. is. And um, the one thing uh, I'll just leave you with is Robert Kiyosaki and I were in New York once, and we were walking through the Javits Center. Um, at one of these Trump events we were doing. And there was these beautiful models sitting there with these big brochures and they were sitting, you know, the, you know, the, the you know, the, the big backdrop and they were, they, they were pitching hard. And then we went next to the one next and, and uh, the guy's like, I got this little deal here. And it's kind of a, you know, a small little brochure. And we, we went back and I said, you know, it's interesting because the, the, this is the better deal. The one that's not so promoted. And, and what happens yeah is a lot of the deals that we're talking about here, guys, um, they happen very quickly and almost without business plans. Now, you have to put business plans around them, but they make sense and to everyone. And and so the bigger the brochure, the worse the deal. So that's what I would say. <laughs> Be careful. That's- that's a good advice. You know, you mentioned they mentioned the money thing real quick. Uh, you know, it reminds me of Tony Robbins' quote about you don't lack you don't like resources, you lack resourcefulness. And I found that true so many times in my life. And I know you recently spoke, didn't you speak at a Tony Robbins yeah, thing? Yeah, at his wealth mastery. Is, it was really a, I you know oh, just a random cool. email that I got from him, and and he asked me to come down to West Palm Beach, and I did that, and it was a blessing, and and uh, I loved it. And it, you know, it was all virtual, you know, because it's COVID during COVID, and he had. Yeah. I don't know, four or five thousand people from eighty three countries on there, and and but you're right, it's a, it's a That's it's cool. a mindset, guys, and it, 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 we're in a fortunate uh, uh, that we can now talk about that, and and I think that some people are sitting back on, 
well, there's no way I can start because I don't have any money. And that seems to be the number one thing. And I get it. I truly get it. But you don't need money. There's so much money looking for, for deals that if you have a deal, it gets funded pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. We just... I was all freaked out because we, you know, not freaked out. It's the wrong word. I was nervous because, you know, I've been raising for mobile home parks for a long time because of the affordability out. thing. And Don't then lie. we added, okay, free, free. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I just raised like a 20 some million dollar. Now this is going to sound yeah, small to some people and huge to other well. people, but I, yeah, I thought I tapped out the well, like you raised like 20, $22 million for uh, my mobile home park fund, closed that. And then this huge apartment deal came up in Houston and I'm like, oh man. And then like I had to raise like 13 million. We raised 19 million in five days. And it's yep. like, geez. And like, and there, we have a waiting list of 250 people now that are like, no, I didn't get in. Like I want, you know, I want in on the next one. So there is money out there. People is what I'm saying is there's money out there because a lot of people are nervous about the stock market. They're nervous about different things. They've, their house has gone up in value a million dollars over the last couple of years. And like, they've got money. They don't know what to do with it. And so if you can be the person that puts together the deal, you can be the one that finds the deal, that manages the systems, that you're the hustle, you're the education, you're the drive. There are people out there willing to invest with you. Andrew Cushman, uh, my friend, was buying a place in Fort Walton, Florida. And I told him, I will buy into your deal and you can tell people I'm doing it. And we had a handshake and that stinker had that thing funded within 24 hours. Of, like uh, it, it was a yeah, very yeah. like a fifty million dollar yeah. place, and I was like, "Dude, what happened?" Yep. He's like, "I actually forgot about you. It happened so fast. Like it just it <laughs> filled up so quick." And I was like, "Man, this is like like they opened That's the door awesome. to the club and they let everybody in, and I'm left outside. And they're like, oh, we don't have any more room not for you.' <laughs> so yeah, like even he didn't do it on purpose. That's a good friend of mine, and um, it still happened. So yeah. Ken, that's a great point. You don't need money. You need knowledge. You need skill. You need deal flow. Yep. You need to have confidence and know what you're doing. But the money is probably the least important part right now. That's right. That's why you stay yeah. on bigger pockets. Read everything. Watch everything. You know, become a member. I'm telling you guys, it's like it's that. education. It's education, and it'll open your mind up, and the money will drop right in. Trust me, people who are looking for deals are not looking for money as, as much mm -hmm. as they are for yeah. deals. That's so true. Well, man, thank you so much. We got one last segment of the show we'll head over to right now, and that is our Famous Four. This is the Famous Four, the part of the show where we ask the same four questions to every guest every week, so we're going to throw them at you. Uh, normally, we ask people about the your favorite real estate-related book, but I want to, you know, I want to actually ask you the other question that we ask uh, authors typically. And that is, is there a habit or trait that you're currently working on improving in your own life? Something that you, you're trying to improve about your life? Yeah, for me, um, I, I, uh, I have a tough time saying no. So I take on too mm. much. And so for me, I'm always looking at how, you know, how can I have my business working for me so that I'm not working yeah. in it? So that's been, it always sucks me back into, you know, so I'm constantly Same. trying to pull out. Yes. That's so, Same. so exactly. Exactly. I was just telling someone, I hired a new uh, woman and she's doing amazing. Her name's Karen and Karen's worked with me for two weeks and she's already like, let's just expand all over the country. And I'm like, oh, you're too much like me. This is going to be a problem because it always just, we see the vision. We're like, oh, I could do that. We go take the yes. bite yeah. and we just don't realize how much chewing gets done once you take it in yeah. your mouth and then you're choking for the next you know, six months to a year on all the work of management that we never think about. <laughs> <laughs> the other, the other day I'm sitting there, we were just about to launch BP con. This is now a few weeks ago now, but uh, we're about to launch the, you know, the big bigger pockets conference. And the like three days before I look at the website and I was like, Oh man, this, this is not good. And I, I was like, what's going on team. And they're like, Oh, well we didn't have any developer or designer. We couldn't get it done in time. I'm like, oh, geez. All right. So I stayed up to like one in the morning and I built the web like myself. Like I'm sitting there like multimillionaire real estate yeah. investor guy and I'm building a website till one in the morning because like, I can't say yeah. no to that. I'm yeah. like, I can't let it go. Yeah. Not good enough. I have the same problem. Yeah. So anyway, the BPCon website. Yeah. Go check it out. BPCon2021.com. Uh, all right. Uh, next question, David. Green. What is your favorite business book? I've, I heard you know a thing or two about business books. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> gosh. So I am constantly reading. I think one of the ones that that um, I I always kind of go back to is that Good to Great with Jim Collins, and I know that's yeah, that's that's a while good. back, but I always dust that off. I always, you know, the it's interesting. My friend that uh, started Cold Stone had Jim Collins speak once, and so he's like, "Come on down and check him out." So the first thing he said was, "You know, how many of you in the room think you're level five leaders?" 
And half the room raised their hands. And he said, a level five leader would never raise their hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so there's like level one, two, three, four, five. And so for me, yeah. as I was building my company, I was trying to be what he would call a level four leader, have some humility, have some vision, have some culture. Uh, and so I, I, I always just really still resonate with that book, even though it's got, got 15 years old now, I guess. Did you say you the Cold Stone guy? Yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah, Doug. Well, no, no, Doug, uh, my friend that started Cold yeah. Stone. He's actually our, yeah, he, he's our governor, yeah. actually, in Arizona at the- Oh, no way. Yeah, he's an e, he's funny. An e, he, I, he was in my EO forum, of all things. And uh, he, that's he cool. was starting Cold Stone at the time. Um, yep. I worked at, I worked at Cold oh. Stone. That was my, that was one of my very first jobs, singing for tips and, yep. uh, making yep. ice cream. I gained four, 40 pounds that <laughs> I year. Bet you like, did. I, gained, I gained 40 pounds in one year working at Cold Stone That's Creamery. Awesome. It was the best job I ever had. It was so good. Awesome. <laughs> All right. David, next question. That level five leader story cracks me up. It reminds me of a story I heard about a, uh, a church that gave one of its members the most humble award. And they presented him with yeah. a button that, that said, I'm the most humble. And they had to take it away the next day because he wore it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Other than listening to my terrible jokes, what is uh, what are some hobbies of yours, Ken? Well, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm going to play golf right after this. And so I do enjoy golf. Uh, I'll be on the lake probably tonight. Uh, you know, I'm up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho at the moment. And uh, nice. yeah, so I, I love being outside, man, hiking. I've done Kilimanjaro twice uh, with really? both my kids. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm a, that's cool. Um, you know, I need something like, you know, like you guys, I need like a goal out there somewhere. And, um, and so for me, it's just, uh, keeping my body healthy. Cause as you guys know, um, you know, you can make all the money you want, but if, if you're not healthy, it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, Don't make your money at cold stone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you're young, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. When you're 20. Yeah. yeah, that's all right. All right. Well, my last question of the day, if you had to really boil it down, what would you say separates successful real estate investors from all those who give up or they fail or they just plain never get started? So it's funny. Uh, I think it's a discipline issue and, and you, you know, there's, I think a lot of people, it, when, when when people talk about real estate investing, I think that they think that there's going to be a package that's going to work perfectly set on their desk and it's going to, you know, everything's going to be just exactly fine. Um, and as yeah. you guys know, the the real money is made in, in deals that are completely broken somehow. They're, you know, they're 50% vacant. There's a lot of capital yep. work and, you know, and you, you're basically solving somebody's problem, usually a bank's or maybe even a seller. And so I think what happens is um, that people don't know how to persevere. Maybe they don't have the right team. And so my experience has been that people buy and then they, they try to time the market and it doesn't work for them potentially, or they have a bad management issue because they've made bad choices and they never really look at themselves. They look at, you know, the real estate. And so they're pointing outwards instead of inwards. And if they looked at uh, some of the, uh, some of the, the basic things that you guys teach, then I think they ha they would have a very, very good experience. And so I think it's discipline and education. Yeah. I love it. I cannot, cannot argue with that. Well, Ken, this has been fantastic once again. Uh, I love chatting with you every time. I feel like I already w always walk away a little bit smarter. So thank you for uh, gracing us with your presence. Hey, you guys are the best. Thanks again. I I very, very much appreciate it. And by the way, we, we are giving away an ebook uh, on, on our oh, please. KenMacroy.com uh, slash bigger pockets. And it's the 21 keys to real estate if, if anybody's interested. Everyone is interested. Every, everyone should go there right now because that's awesome. Dude, I will learn anything from you. I'm going to go there. Uh, thank you. Hey, my awesome. pleasure, guys. It's always a great uh, chat with you guys. And let's do this again soon. As the market continues to change, we could go back and refer to our, our old conversation yeah. and see if we were right or not. I actually kind of like that. When I remember when, when COVID first hit yeah. and the shelter in place happened, there was just panic and yeah. chaos. And I've gone yeah. back and listened to some of the stuff I said back then to see how, how accurate was I? Was I, was I on or was I yeah. off? Because it's a scary position yep. we're all in. It is. And I'll just say people should go back and listen. That's all I'm going to say. Go hear what I had to say. <laughs> all right, Ken. Uh, did we ask where people can find out more about you? Yep. Just go to KenMacro.com. And uh, we got a whole website there with all kinds of stuff that they can learn from and, and, and uh, 
And just know that everything on there, everything we do all goes to our charity. You know, it's, uh, we it. make our money in real estate and, and, uh, I really, really, really like teaching. And that's why I jumped on board with Robert. I spoke to him this morning. Um, and you guys, I love being on these platforms. I, uh, I think, um, man, if, if people can change not only themselves, but their families and, you know, their, their, uh, families, families, it, it, it's the best gift you can give them is education. That's fantastic, man. Appreciate it. Well, David, why don't you get us out Thank of here? You, Ken. Great job today. My pleasure, David. Good chat with you guys. This is David Green for Brandon, the Cold Stone Creamer Turner, signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.